So, the uh, slides here are organized in the following manner. Uh, we start with uh, intuition of uh, what is normalization and then we give a very brief definition of uh, normal forms using uh, after introducing the notion of functional dependencies and after that we get into details of functional dependencies including um, how to do attribute closure um, and then get into the definition of BCNF once you have, we have seen how to uh, you know do inferencing with functional dependencies and then we will also look at canonical cover and third normal form and then a little bit about uh, the database design process and temporal uh, modeling towards the end. So, as is uh, traditional with normalization, we start off by showing a bad design uh, in this case, where we have instructors which have been joined with their department information. So, this could be the result of a query that is fine, but if instead of storing instructor and department separately, our design somehow combined the two, you are going to get a table like this, where uh, there are, um, let us look for some repetition here, computer science, CADS is in computer science, as is brand, and then the uh, building and budget information is repeated here. So, that is a simple example of redundancy, I am sure you are all familiar with that. So, uh, here is another example, uh, we had a section and then we had a section class relationship. Uh, supposing we combine those two, so we have uh, course ID, section ID, semester year, building room number. So, these could have been uh, two relations which we would have got from the ER design if we created a separate relation for section class. We actually did not, we actually combined it to get this thing. Here, there is no problem with uh, repetition. Although we have combined two tables, there is no problem with repetition. So, what these two examples illustrate is in some cases there is repetition, in some cases there is not. And functional dependencies basically help us understand in what cases there will be repetition and in what cases we can be sure there would not be repetition. Why are we sure there would not be repetition here? Well, of course, in this case, uh, this is actually a special case where this is really the same as this. When we combine it, there is no extra information here. Uh, so, you know, the merged relate, we are actually throwing out one relation, but in general, uh, th this would not be the case where one is subsumed by that. Okay. So, the uh, basic idea is uh, we start with a design which came probably from ER, but in many cases people directly come up with a database design and then we need to figure out whether that design has redundancy. There is another thing which is required, which is not actually covered by the functional dependency theory, which is can this design actually represent all the information that we need to represent. And, uh, we will come back to that issue in a little bit. Um, so, the idea is that if there is redundancy, we will decompose it and how do we detect redundancy? There is repetition of information of some form. So, what tells us that information is repeated? There are several kinds of constraints on the schema, on the data which is stored in there, which tell us that in these cases, some information is going to get repeated. Now, what kind of constraints are there? Functional dependencies are the most widely used kind of constraint, they are the most common and uh, the most useful, which will tell us that there is some redundancy, but they are the, not the only kind. There are others which theoreticians have come up with, uh, including multi value dependencies, which we will see briefly, and then there are other kinds of dependencies which we will not cover here, uh, which also show that there is redundancy. So, if there is redundancy, what is the standard way of dealing with the problem of redundancy? The standard way is to break up relations such that if you join them back, you will get back the original information. However, there is no redundant information stored, which also brings up the question, why are we so worried about redundancy? Is it disk space? Certainly not. I mean, today we have uh, such large disk that except for uh, you know few web scale databases uh, you know the email and other information that 
Yahoo keeps about you or Facebook keeps, you know, except for those. For most organizations, the there's, space is not really a constraint for relational data. For video data, yes. For relational data, it's not space. So, redundancy is not about space. Redundancy is about inconsistency. And why would you have inconsistency? If you took um, instructor and department and joined them, we can be sure there is no inconsistency be between two tuples in there, which both belong to CompSci. We know they will have the same building and the same budget. But if you stored the relation as a join, and then you updated, there is a risk that you updated one tuple and didn't update the other. And what makes it worse is afterwards, once this has happened, somebody who comes in doesn't know which is the correct one. Is it the first one or the second one? Which is correct? They don't know. So you want to make sure there is no scope for these kinds of errors, where an update can leave the database in an inconsistency. So if you Ensure there is no redundancy, there is no problem with updates. Now, there are other ways of dealing with it too, um, which is if there is any redundancy, it is not at the level of uh, you know, something which the user would directly update, but it could be something which the database computes. And an example of this is materialized views, which we discussed earlier. So, in a materialized view, there is redundancy. It is repeating information which is in the base tables. However, here update is not an issue because you will not go and directly update the materialized view normally. The, that is usually the job of the database system. And the database system will ensure that when you update the underlying relations, this will be kept up to date. So, there, there is no real problem with redundancy as far as consistency goes. So, that is, um, you know, if you want performance, you make sure that there is no redundancy here, and then use materialized views to deal with performance or other issues. That is a general way in which uh, systems are designed. Okay, so, now, in this uh, particular case, um, as not surprisingly, the functional dependency, which tells us that there is a problem when we join instructor and department, is department name functionally determines building and budget. So, given a department name, the building is unique, the budget is unique. You can't have two different budgets to the same department or two different buildings. Now, of course, um, computer science department here actually has two buildings. So, this models a situation where each department is in one building. If you didn't want to insist on that, we would have to have a separate department building mapping table. Um, again, to keep the schema small, we have done this. So, again, a lot of the Motivation for our schema design is not to make it realistic, but to keep it simple. Okay. Now, here is uh, another example of a decomposition, which is bad. Um, so, supposing we had um, this thing, employee with an ID, name, street, city, salary. And we decompose this into employee ID name and employee, employee 1 ID name, employee 2 name, street, city, salary. Now, what would go wrong here? Yeah, if there are two employees with the same name, what is going to happen is this one is okay, but this one will not map uniquely to one here. There are going to be two rows for two different employees with the same name, different street city salary. And if we join it back, we are not going to know whether, an example here, uh, supposing I started with this these two people had the same name. Uh, the name Kim is uh, common to about half the people in Korea, apparently. So, there is a high probability of uh, the name repeating. Um, so, if you decompose it and then join it back, uh, here are two tuples. This first tuple and this first tuple actually were matching. The second and the second were matching. If we join this back, we are going to get four tuples. So, when we decompose the relation and then join it back, have we lost tuples? No, we got the original tuples back, but we also got extra tuples. So, what have we lost? We have lost information. We have not lost tuples, but we have lost information that this corresponded to this and this address corresponded to this second kill. So, this decomposition is a lossy join decomposition. Now, you might 
start with a schema where by mistake you have already decomposed it into a lossy join decomposition. How will you recognize this? If you started with a schema which is already decomposed and now you use functional dependencies to check if there is any redundancy, you, will, you may not find any redundancy. If you look at these two schemas, you already decomposed it. Is there any redundancy here? There is not. Here the functional dependency will say id determines name. Here there is no functional dependency, assuming two people may share the same address, which can happen if they are married, for example. Um, there is no redundancy here. Uh, so, if you look at these two relations, everything seems fine, but there is a problem. If you look at the information of the enterprise you want to represent, you will realize that you are not able to represent certain information. Okay? So, that is a separate issue which you also need to be concerned about in design. Now, here is another example of a lossless joint decomposition. This is just a instance of these two relations, um, where uh, we decompose it into A, B and B, C. And what do we see here? We project and join back, you will get the same thing. Now, what property here shows us that um, would guarantee rather, it, what kind of constraint using functional dependencies would guarantee that uh, if you decompose this like this and then join natural join it back, you will get the original one. The common attributes, yeah. So, R 1 intersection, well, uh, if you mean the intersection of the attributes, yeah, no, not the relations, the at intersection of the attributes. Uh, is in this case B. Yeah. So, that should functionally determine, it should functionally determine either uh, you know the remaining attributes of this one or of this one. Now, why is that a sufficient condition? Uh, in this case, uh, again this is an example which satisfies the functional dependency, but in reality we have to insist that the functional dependency must hold on the relation. That is, any legal instance of the relation must satisfy the functional dependency. We cannot just look at this example and say this relation satisfies the functional dependency. All we can say here is that this example satisfies, this instance satisfies the functional dependency. So, what is the functional dependency? Given, um, a D, so in this case, um, we could insist either that B functionally determines C. What does that mean? Um, if there are two tuples, which are the same on B, they must be the same on C also here in this case. If there are two things which have the same B value, their C value must be the same. Or conversely, we could also alternatively insist that if two B values are the same, then their A values must also be the same. Okay. So, that would be a sufficient condition. It is not a necessary condition. There are other conditions which also guarantee lossless joint. Decomposing the relation and hmm. fragmenting the relation. What is the exact difference? Um, so, because in distributed database fragmentation concept. Right. So, in distributed databases, there is a notion. There are two notions of fragmentation. One is vertical, and the other is horizontal. So, horizontal fragmentation is just keeping some tuples here and some tuples there. That does not have any uh, impact on the schema itself, because you can always union the tuples and get the same thing back. The vertical fragmentation is identical to decomposition. So, in distributed databases, when you do vertical fragmentation, we will insist that there is a key. Um, so, essentially, the same lossless joint decomposition condition will be used there. In fact, we generally use a stronger condition there that there is a value which is a key for both of the sites. For lossless joint, we only need to insist that it is a key for one of the sites. I, I mean, I am kind of jumping ahead. I have slides on all that a bit ahead. Uh, but in the distributed database case, normally you would have something which is a key on both sides. Yeah. Any questions? So, um, we also have this notion of normal forms uh, of which the first normal form does not depend on functional dependencies, but the later ones are defined in terms of functional dependencies and some of the other ones are defined in terms of other kinds of dependencies like multi-valued and other dependencies. So, what is a first normal form? 
Uh, this is one of the basic things. Uh, like, again, most of you are familiar with this, that we insist that every domain is atomic. That is, in any relation, in any attribute, whatever value is there has, should not be decomposable into parts. So, what does that mean? You cannot have a set. This history comes from before relational model, in the earlier network and hierarchical models. It was common to have a set of values. So, you had a record where one of the attributes was a set. And the relational model basically recognized that this is a bad idea uh, because it complicates the whole model for joins and everything else. And it also encourages designs with redundancy. And therefore, the relational model insisted that any uh, value in there should not be a set, it should be atomic. But it actually means more. It is not just that it is not a set. Um, well, even composite attributes are kind of banned. However, we know that they are not really a problem. A composite attribute is just a name for a collection of attributes. But at least in the basic relational model, that is also banned. And we saw already how to convert a composite attribute to um, flattened thing. We also saw how to convert a multi-valued attribute to a relational schema. So, we know it can be done. So, a relation is in first normal form if the domains of all its attributes are atomic. Now, atomicity is not just uh, that the value is not a set, but it is also a property of how the elements in the domain are used. So, for example, um, in IIT Bombay in earlier years, we had a roll number which encoded the year the person joined, the branch and then some other things and finally, a sequence number at the end. And people actually interpreted these digits. So, they would say uh, the fourth and fifth uh, digit or third and fourth digit, uh, that is a code which says which branch the person is in. And people would not only would humans look at the roll number and say, oh, this person is in computer science or this person in E, but we even had programs in our application programs, which would look at those two digits and say, this person is CS or E. Now, what is happening here? You are actually breaking up what appears to be a string into pieces. You are interpreting it. So, this is also an example of something which is not in first normal form, because you are breaking it up. Now, what is wrong with doing this? Well, there are many things. Um, but the most important practical problem with this is, uh, there were several, but one of them was um, that you are breaking up a string into pieces and those pieces are supposed to be a foreign key. Now, you cannot enforce that in the relational model, that is one problem. The second problem is, what if um, this student changes branch, which can happen. Now, the roll number change has to change because those two digits are interpreted as the branch. So, the roll number has to change. If you do that, a change in one relation which recorded which branch the student was in required a change in the roll number, which caused a cascading thing in every place where the roll number was used. So, that was a mess. So, internally actually the system was designed to store some other student ID which was unique, which would not change. So, everywhere where registration and other information, the student ID was used, not the roll number, which again complicated the design and queries and so on. Uh, but the worst problem was that roll numbers would get updated periodically and inside the database, you could deal with it. Outside of the database, when I uh, have the marks for my students, in the middle of the semester, the student's roll number changes. And the list I get at the end of the semester for putting in grades does not match the list I had at the beginning of the semester. And I have to guess that this student is really now this roll number. Um, how do I do that? I do it on the name. What if two students with the same name both had a roll number change? We are in trouble. So, the bottom line is, if you start interpreting parts of an attribute, there are a number of problems with it. So, you really should not do that. Humans may do it, but in the database, you should not do it. I, I normally find very tough time explaining this atomicity, but mm. uh, I mean, see, the, this, uh, I mean, see, complex attributes could be argued that not atomic. And yeah. sometimes some people say 
um, you are right. Now, if you treat a set of values and never break it up into pieces, never look at it in the database and it is only external, it may be okay. Uh, there are also other reasons for efficiency of storage and so on, why people uh, sometimes use set valued attributes. There are issues. So, if you just want to represent data correctly, you should not worry about efficiency. But when you build an application, you obviously want it to run reasonably fast and not take up too much space. So, it would be nice if you can have a conceptual model and then a storage model, which differs maybe significantly from the conceptual model. That would be nice. So, for example, uh, let us say uh, I have a, uh, I, I want to build an index on the words in a document. Now, the database may support the index natively, but supposing it does not. Then one way to do it is I can create a relation with a record ID, so of a primary key and keyword. So, I have uh, something with record ID and so this is a relation. So, if a record ID 1 had keywords A and B, I will have 1 A, 1 B. If I allowed a set of keywords, I could have written it as 1 A comma B. Okay. Now, if you see this representation, there are two tuples. Each tuple has some space overhead and also this record ID is represented twice, whereas it is represented once here. This is not allowed in first normal form. In first normal form, you have to do this. As long as the relations are small, we do not care. So, uh, it is you know why do we bother about normal forms? There are two reasons. Uh, one is uh, uh, redundancy and uh, update issues and so on and the other is efficiency. So, there are trade offs between these and sometimes you in general we would like to not worry about efficiency at least at the beginning. And at the end, when you realize there is an efficiency problem, give a bit of uh, slack and move away from conceptual cleanness to allow a little more efficient representation. So, for example, in this situation, um, so we have a database with uh, documents, a lot of documents. And these keyword lists for a document can become very, very large. Uh, we also need uh, the opposite way. So, given a keyword, I want which all documents can contain it 1, 3, 9, 11, and so on. So, this relation here actually includes information which is equivalent to either this or this. Both of these would be here. So, conceptually, the relational model says store this. And then, if I look up all the tuples of the keyword, I will get all the record IDs. If I look up a record ID, I will get all the keywords. So, conceptually that is fine, but practically there are two issues. Um, if the relation is stored in record ID order, if I want to find all the records with a particular keyword, they are scattered all over the relation. And conversely, if I want to find all the keywords in the relation, they may be clustered, but if I flip it and cluster the relation on keyword, then this would be inefficient. So, for efficiency sake, I may actually keep this and this depending on what I want to do, I may keep both, although this is the conceptual model. So, again queries may have to be written taking into account the fact that this is the actual schema. Uh, but if you had this conceptual schema and then let and the database would automatically maintain these two and provide these as a view, then I could query these views, but store this normalized form as the underlying representation. But, but like this could be viewed as a create maintaining indexes or, yeah. or like tweaking yes. with, with the physical part of the exactly or Im tweaking with the implementation part. That would be ideal. That is the correct way of doing it. Um, in fact, there have been a lot of proposals which say that you can have a conceptual schema, but the physical database may store some other schema. It does not even store the conceptual schema. Yeah. For efficiency, it stores some other schema. But you can uh, write your queries and updates based on the conceptual schema and the database deals with all of this. But properly uh, layered. Yeah. So, again uh, no database really supports that fully, but some aspects of it are supported. Okay. So, I think we have digressed a bit. <laughs> Let us uh, come back uh, to make sure we finish on time. Okay. So, uh, most of this chapter is going to focus on decomposition uh, based on um, the um, functional dependencies and a little bit on multivalue. So, let us uh, look a little more formally at what is a functional dependency. 
Uh, let's let's look at example. Then I'll go back. A functional dependency is uh, has a left hand side and a right hand side, both of which are subsets of attributes of the relational schema. You are probably familiar with this. And we say that a functional dependency holds if on any legal relation on that schema, uh, whenever two tuples of that relation agree on attributes uh, A alpha, they have the same value of alpha, then they must also agree on the attributes beta. So, that is if uh, for any pair of tuples T 1, T 2 in that relation, T 1 alpha equal to T 2 alpha implies T 1 beta equal to T 2 beta. This is the standard definition. Uh, and as an example, if you have this one, um, does this is A and this is B. A functionally determines B does not hold, because there are two tuples here with the same value of A, different values of B. Uh, B determines A holds on this instance. So, there is a uh, that does not mean it will hold on all instances of R, unless we say that this is a constraint on R. So, we use it in one of two ways. We either say that um, you know here is an instance, let us see what holds on it, but that is not particularly useful. What is more useful is a constraint on the relation, which says in any legal state of this relation, this dependency must hold. So, that is what we are going to be using. So, now we have seen this notion of super keys on a schema. So, if R is the set of attributes in the schema and K is any subset of that, then we can say that K is a super key if K functionally determines R. Again, you are probably familiar with these for those of you who are not going over this. And that is a super key. What is a candidate key? It is a super key which is minimal. So, you cannot throw anything out. So, what this is, is uh, K is the candidate key if and only if K functionally determines R. That is uniqueness. And for no alpha subset of K does alpha functionally determine R. Do we actually have to check every subset of K? To check if it is a candidate key, do we have to look at every subset of K? We do not. We can just look at subsets which are one attribute less. So, if k has five attributes, we can look at all four attribute subsets, remove one attribute at a time and again check if the remaining four attributes are a super key. Okay. If any one of these four attribute subsets is a super key, then we can be sure that k is not a candidate key. If all the four attribute subsets are not super keys, then we can say that K is a candidate. Uh, and also note that functional dependencies generalize the notion of super keys. Um, so, if you only have this idea of super keys, which is the uh, key declaration in SQL, uh, then here is a functional dependency on this combined instructor department relation, which says that department name functionally determines building and budget. We cannot express that using only super keys, but we can express that by saying a department name determines building. Um, we can also say that department name determines budget, but we could also say that ID determines name, salary, department name, and ID also determines building and budget. So, all of these hold, but you would not expect that um, department name functionally determine salary, because there may be two people in the same department with different salaries. So, given a um, set of functional dependencies, uh, again we can check if a particular uh, relation is uh, legal. So, uh, that is one way and we will say that that instance satisfies F or we will specify constraints on the set of all legal relations. Which where we say that the functional uh, the functional dependency F holds on that schema R. That is the notation we will use. Okay. Again, by chance certain things may satisfy a functional dependency, but um, we will not say that that holds on the schema. Again, some notation there is a what are called trivial functional dependencies which are going to hold on any schema. Now, what are these? They are basically those where the right hand side is a subset of the left hand side. So, here are two examples, id comma name 
functionally determines id obviously or name functionally determines name obviously so these things we don't really care about they're not very useful now let's see what are some things we can do with functional dependencies um, we can given a pair of functional dependencies a determines b and b determines c we can say that given an a b is uniquely determined given a b c is uniquely determined therefore given an a c must be uniquely determined so that is a transitive uh, closure of well not the closure it's just a transitive combination of these two um, so we can determine that a function determines c now we could perhaps make more inferences and there are several ways in which we can make inferences using functional dependencies uh, we could just you know try it out and take everything and try to prove whether it holds or not from first principles what is the first principle the basic definition that if the left hand sides are equal the right hand sides are equal just using that definition we can infer a number of things uh, but what we would like is a somewhat more systematic way of making these inferences rather than uh, just using the original definition. So we are going to see uh, how to do that more systematically. But conceptually, the set of all functional dependencies logically implied by a given set of functional dependencies. Now, f over here denotes a set of functional dependencies. So the set of all things logically implied is the closure of f. In this case, the closure of a, b, and b, c is what? Well, it, the closure is AB, BC, and AC. We cannot infer anything else in this case. This is it. Uh, well, that is not strictly speaking true. We can infer a number of trivial dependencies from this. We can also infer a number of things uh, which are not quite trivial, but um, so for example, uh, CA determines CB. If A determines B, we can also infer that C A determines C B. C A determines C B trivial? It is not. It is not trivial. The right is not a subset of the left. How do we, uh, what makes us believe that if A functionally determines B, C A functionally determines C B? We know that if two tuples are equal on C A, well, the C's are obviously equal. The B's are equal by the definition, but because we are saying that A functionally determines B. So, C A will determine CB. So, we can infer these kinds of things also, which are not trivial. Um, on the other hand, they are easily inferred from the existing ones. So, there are a number of things one can infer given a set of functional dependencies and this entire set is the closure. So, the closure can be very big. It can have an, uh, it will have, if you include exponential, uh, sorry, if you include the trivial ones, we are pretty much guaranteed it is exponential size. If you, even if you exclude the trivial ones, it can st still be exponential size. Exponential in what? In the number of attributes. And F plus denotes the closure of F. Uh, generally, we do not really want to compute the closure as far as possible, uh, at least manually. You can have a program to do it, that is fine. Uh, it, you know, you may say, even for a program, exponential is bad. Uh, and but it is kind of okay because relation schemas tend not to be very big. How big are they? 5, 10 attributes. You know, uh, 2 power 10 is not such a big deal, it is just 1000. Uh, on the other hand, if you had a schema with 1000 attributes, you have a problem, but I, I have never seen such a big schema, uh, except in situations where you have what are called flexible schemas, where you can introduce attributes as you please. Uh, there are some systems which allow flexible schemas. But there you are not going to worry about normalization. So that is not an issue. Okay. Uh, we will see in more detail how to do inferences using functional dependencies. But before we do that, uh, how are we going to use this to define normal forms? Again, this is something many of you would know already. We say that a schema is in BCNF or Boyce Scott normal form with respect to a set F of functional dependencies. If for all functional dependencies in F plus, this is in the closure, not just in the original set. If for everything in the closure of the form alpha goes to beta, one of uh, where uh, of course both of alpha and beta must be subsets of R, then at least one of the following holds. Either it is trivial, 
alpha is a superset of beta, superset of or equal to, or alpha is a super key for R. Okay. So, coming back to our earlier instructor department example, um, is this in BC enough? It is not, because department name functionally determines building and budget, but is department name a super key for this? It is not. Okay. Therefore, this schema is not in BCNF. So, BCNF uh, prevents a certain kind of redundancy. So, given that schema, what do we do? How do we uh, fix the schema? The standard way is decomposing. And the way we do it is, uh, if you have a non-trivial dependency, alpha goes to beta, which shows that the schema violates BCNF, what you do is break it up into two schemas. One is alpha union beta. The other is R minus beta minus alpha. So, we are removing, you know, we are removing beta from R, but we have to make sure we do not remove the attributes in alpha from R. They have to be there. They have to be common to both. So, if in case alpha and beta overlap, which can happen, we are going to remove alpha attributes from beta and then remove the remaining ones from R. That is it. That is how we decompose. So, in our example, um, alpha is department name, beta is building and budget and therefore, we are going to split it into department name, building, budget and the other one will be ID name, salary, department name. This was the original schema we started off with. Now, what if we use the functional dependency? Um, department name functionally determines building budget department name which is also a valid dependency. It is not trivial. If we decompose using that, this step beta minus alpha would remove department name from beta and then we would get the same result. So, that step takes care of it. Now, there is another notion called dependency preservation, um, which uh, probably we will come back to at the end. But Basically, uh, the idea is uh, if you have functional dependencies on one relation, they can be checked efficiently. If you have functional dependencies which span two relations in the decomposition, the only way to check it is to join them back. And um, on the other hand, if the functional dependencies which exist on individual relations imply these, you can logically infer the other ones from the ones which hold on single relations, then you do not have, have to check the ones which cross the relations in a decomposition. Um, so, that is the notion of dependency preservation, which we will come back to later. Um, but that motivates third normal form, which says that if I want to make sure the functional dependencies hold, then I am going to decompose in such a way that only by only checking functional dependencies which hold on the individual relations in the decomposition, that will imply that all the original functional dependencies also hold. So, I do not have to check for those individually, because checking those may be expensive. So, that is the motivation for third normal form. And the definition of third normal form is very much like BCNF except for one step. So, the uh, third normal form, the first part is the same. Uh, for everything, al uh, every dependency alpha goes to beta and f plus, either it is trivial or alpha is a super key or this is the last one, every attribute a in beta minus alpha is contained in a candidate key for r. Uh, we will see later why this is uh, useful, but um, without proof, I will just state that the third condition is a minimal relaxation of BCNF to ensure dependency preservation. I am um, saying here we will see why later, but for the abbreviated version it is not there, but it is there in the book. So, what are the goals? We want to decompose such that each schema is in a good form. Um, well, we want to check if it is in a good form. If not decompose, the decomposition has to be lossless join and preferably the decomposition should be decom dependency preserving, but that is a trade off there between that and redundancy. We will see that. Okay, so, let us focus now on functional dependency theory. Uh, that was a quick introduction to what we want to do with functional dependencies. So, 
how do we uh, compute the closure of a given set of functional dependencies? That is the first question. We have already seen what is the closure. So, there are a set of uh, three rules called Armstrong's axioms, which are actually sufficient. We just apply them and we will get the closure. Now, what are the three rules? The first rule is reflexivity. If beta subset of alpha, then alpha functionally determines beta. What does this rule do? It basically generates every trivial dependency, because these are all trivial ones. If beta subset alpha, it is trivial. So, this one rule basically generates all trivial ones. The second rule is if alpha functionally determines beta, then gamma alpha functionally determines gamma beta. Okay. Now, this rule is called augmentation. Now, again, we do not have to do this for a, you know, we can use this rule to show just one trivial dependency or we could use this rule to generate all trivial dependencies. Similarly, here with augmentation, we could use this rule to augment one given dependency with one particular gamma or we can generate all possible augmentations of alpha goes to beta. That depends on what we want to do with these rules. And finally, the transitivity one which we saw already, if alpha goes to beta, beta goes to gamma, then alpha goes to gamma. Now, it is easy to show that these rules are sound, that whatever inferences you make here are correct. How do we show that? We can show it from first principles. We can show that if the definition of functional dependency holds um, for this, then it will also hold for this. And similarly, if this holds and this holds, then that also holds. So, it is easy to show soundness. What is not easy is to show that these are complete. How do you know that these three rules will generate all possible functional dependencies in F plus? Again, that is not trivial to prove. Uh, so, we would not try to prove it, but it is true. So, here is an example uh, with these functional dependencies on this schema. And so, let us look at some inferences we can make. We have inferred A goes to H. How do we infer that? Yeah. So, that was easy. A determines B and B determines H. So, the transitivity we can get that. Now, here is the next one. A G determines I. How do we get this? Yeah. So, from A determines C, we can determine we have to augment it with A g determines C g and then we can use transitivity to from A g goes to C g plus C g goes to i to determine A g goes to i. Any questions? Okay. There are many more inferences one can make. Um, so, we will look at more of these in the tutorial session. Um, but if you are using Armstrong's axioms, um, th those are just three axioms. They are enough, but it is often useful to uh, you know use these extra axioms, which can be proved using Armstrong axioms. Uh, and what are these? The union rule says if alpha determines beta and alpha determines gamma, then alpha determines functionally determines that is beta gamma. So we can union the right hand sides. And conversely, if alpha functionally determines beta gamma then alpha must function and determine beta and alpha must function and determine gamma. How do we prove these? Again, we can prove it either from first principle using the definition of functional dependency or we can use Armstrong's axioms to prove these. Uh, we will again do some of this later. And finally, uh, there is uh, pseudo transitivity. I mean, it is not finally. There are many more such rules which we can create, but these are in practice the most useful ones. Uh, so, the last one is if alpha uh, function determines beta and gamma beta function determines delta, then alpha gamma function determines delta. Does this look familiar? We just saw an example of it that A g determines i, which we showed is really an example of we could have directly used pseudo transitivity rule to determine A g goes to i, but we equivalently showed it in two steps. Then there is another notion that what we have seen so far is the closure of the set of functional dependencies. 
there's a different notion of closure, which is closure of an attribute set. What is the closure of an attribute set? Given a set of attributes alpha, the closure of alpha under f denoted by alpha plus is the set of attributes that are functionally determined by alpha under the constraints f. So, um, here is an algorithm to com compute it and then we will see an example also. So, how would we compute this? We initially set the result to alpha. Now, we are going to look at um, any every functional dependency beta. Now, if beta is a subset of result, so what can we say? So, what we have started off with is alpha is the initial set, it functionally determines alpha. Now, if we have initially at least, we have a functional dependency whose left hand side is a subset of alpha, then we can clearly say that the right hand side attributes are also functionally determined. Uh, do I have an example here? Yeah. Let me do it by example and then come back to the algorithm. So, this is the same set of dependencies. I want to compute A g plus. So, given A g as the initial set, I know that because A functionally determines B, I can infer that A g functionally determines B also. Okay. So, what is the first thing? Let me use the board. So, I will start with A g. Now, using A goes to B, I am going to add B to that set. Now, using A goes to C, I can add C to that set. Now, using C g goes to H, I can add H to that set. Now, again using C g goes to I, I will add I to that set. Using B goes to H, I will add H to that set. Oh, it is already there. Sorry. That is it. Uh, there is nothing more which can be added. So, A g plus is equal to that. So, what can we say now about A g? It is a super key for this schema. Is it a candidate key? Yeah, we have to check if A plus and if required G plus also. What is A plus? It will be A b c h and that is it. We cannot progress anymore. Oh, um, where did you get i? No, i c g. We do not have g here. So, we cannot include i. So, this is it. So, we can uh, be sure that a plus does not include this and um, we have to check for every subset. What about uh, G plus? <coughs> Nothing. We cannot do anything. So, G plus is equal to just G. So, neither subset uh, of A uh, of A G is a super key. Therefore, A G is a candidate key. So, attribute closure is actually a lot easier to deal with than using Armstrong's axiom. Uh, you can kind of do it blindly. So, it turns out that many things, uh, if you have to check for certain things manually, attribute closure is an easier way to do it than using Armstrong set. We will see that in a moment. So, this was the algorithm. Um, result is alpha and every uh, keep doing this repeatedly. Whenever uh, you have a dependency whose left hand side is a subset of result, then add the right hand side to the result till nothing more can be added. So, we have seen this already. This was the candidate key part, which we already did on the board and this was the A g plus. We have seen this on the board. So, what do we do with attribute closure? There are many things we could do with it. One is what we just did. If you want to check if something is a super key, we take the closure. Similarly, we can check if it is a candidate key. We can also use it to check if a particular functional dependency holds. How do we do that? If you want to check if alpha functionally determines beta, it is actually very simple. We just take alpha plus and check if beta is contained in that. And uh, this is a very uh, simple test for functional dependencies without actually computing the entire closure. If you want to compute f plus, 
there is a lot of stuff in F plus. So, we really do not want to compute F plus, it is too big. Whereas, this is a much cheaper way of checking if a particular functional dependency holds. Now, if you want to actually compute the closure of F, there are two ways of doing it. One is we use Armstrong's axioms and keep making inferences. The problem with that, if you are doing it manually, is it is very confusing when you, you know, there is nothing more you can do because you have to take multiple dependencies at a time, do the closure, you have to know which ones you have already considered. So, you can do it, but doing it manually is a little difficult. A uh, simpler way of doing it manually is to take every subset of R and then find the closure of the subset. And then for every subset of that closure, we add a dependency, gamma goes to S. Although this last step for every subset of the dependency is often not very useful. Um, so, if we are dealing with closure, instead of taking the exact closure, sometimes it is just enough if for every subset we compute the closure and keep that. We can use that to check certain things. But if you want to get the actual closure of F, then for every S subset of gamma plus, we have to add the dependency gamma goes to S. That is the algorithm. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Sir, uh, in your book, there is a concept available like canonical cover. Yeah. Uh, like uh, here we are going to cover that. Uh, here here we are using yeah. this uh, to test for the super key. Uh, hmm. We can use that concept, canonical cover concept, for testing the candidate keys. Uh, so, canonical cover is. No, not, not it, you can't directly use that for candidate key. You, you can only use it to find a minimal set of functional dependencies, yeah. but that doesn't help you to check if it is a candidate key. A candidate key test is actually very cheap. Um, for if you want to check a particular one thing to see if it's a candidate key, mm -hmm. it's cheap. If you want to enumerate all the candidate keys, then that is more expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it, it is. Uh, it is has some reasons of drop. Uh, no particular reason. Uh, we could have defined it formally, but we have used the concept. Uh, right. the, now coming back to lossless joint decomposition, um, if you have a schema which has R1 and R2, um, which actually this should be union because R1 and R2 may overlap. They should overlap normally for. Uh, lossless joint decomposition. So, if we decompose R into project on R 1 and project on R 2, so that is a decomposition. And now, if you take the decomposition and join it back, lossless joint decomposition requires that this join must be equal to the original R. Now, a sufficient condition for this is the following, which we briefly discussed at the beginning, which is R 1 intersection R 2, that is the intersection of the attributes. In other words, the attributes common to these two must either function determine R 1, that is it is a super key for R 1 or it must function determine R 2, either one is enough. Now, uh, how do you show that this will in ensure lossless join? That is actually fairly straightforward. You can show that if you had a, um, you know, you, you cannot get extra tuples. When you do a join, if you get a particular tuple, because on one side, you know, the this dependency holds, that uh, if you take a, any tuple on the other side, it will combine with only one tuple on this side. So, you will not get any extra tuples when you do the join. And therefore, you can show that the join relation will be exactly equal to the original relation. So, it is lossless join. Now, is that a necessary condition? Are there situations where that functional dependency does not hold, but it is still lossless join? Yes, uh, there are such situations where it can happen using multi value dependencies, for example, or maybe even joint dependencies, which we are not going to cover. Now, given um, this particular relation with this pair of functional dependencies, we can decompose it into A B goes A B and B C. Is this lossless join? Yes, because B is common and B determines B C. Now, there is this other notion of dependency preserving. So, what are the dependencies uh, which are there individually? On R 1, you have A B and I am not just looking at which of these are there in R 1. By uh, the dependencies 
uh, which hold on R 1, I mean what all in F plus use only attributes in R 1. Okay. In this case, um, A B is really the only one here on R 1. Similarly, on R 2, B C is the only one. Now, is this depend, uh, is this decomposition dependency preserving? Yes, in fact, A B is preserved here, B C is preserved here. So, very trivially it preserves all the dependencies. However, there is another decomposition also of A B C, which is A B and A C. Is this lossless join? Well, the common attribute is A and it um, functionally determines B. Therefore, it is lossless join because it, uh, A determines A B. Is it dependency preserving? It is not. So, what are the dependencies here? A B is preserved. Now, B C is not present here, but from A B and B C you can also infer A C. So, you can actually check A C here. On this one you can check if A C holds. So, we can check if A B holds and A C holds. So, those are the two we can check. From those, can we infer uh, B C? So, given A B, let me write it here, we can check A function determines B, A function determines C. From these two, unfortunately, we cannot infer that B function determines C. So, just by checking these two, we cannot ensure this. If this implied it, then it is enough to check this and this and then there is no need to check that explicitly. It would definitely be true. If these two are true, that would be true, uh, but this implication is not there. Therefore, to see if the decomposition uh, satisfies B function determinant C, what do we have to do? The only way is to join it back and then on the join result check if B function determinant C, which of course is expensive. So, more formally uh, we say that uh, a decomposition is dependency preserving if the following holds, where f 1, f 2, f i is the set of dependencies in f plus that includes only attributes in r n. So, given a decomposition into r 1, r 2 up to r n, we define f 1, f 2 up to f n like this and we say the decomposition is dependency preserving if the union of these these are the ones which can be checked independently on the R 1, R 2 up to R n. If you take the closure of that, if it is equal to F plus, then we can be sure that the decomposition is dependency preserving. If it is not, it is not dependency preserving. Okay. Now, how do you check efficiently if uh, a particular uh, uh, decomposition is dependency preserving? Well, there are details in the book, we are going to skip it here. Now, let us uh, come back to B C N. What have we done so far? We have seen a few things we can do with functional dependencies, how to make inferences, Armstrong axioms, attribute closure. Using these, we can now get back to B C N. After B C N, we will come back to canonical cover and see how to use that to uh, get a 3 N F decomposition, uh, but now let us come back to B C N. So, we have already defined what is B C N. So, how do you check? if um, a particular alpha goes to beta causes a violation of B C N F. Well, that is actually very easy. Uh, we compute alpha plus and see if it includes all the attributes of R. That is, it is a super key or alpha plus is a subset of alpha. It is trivial. One of the two should hold. So, here we have said it is a non-trivial dependency. So, for non-trivial dependencies, uh, alpha plus must include everything in R. This is for a single dependency. Now, here is a, a simplified test uh, to check if a given schema, you are given a schema R with a given set of functional dependencies on R, you are given that. How do you check if it satisfies B C N F? Now, if you look at the definition of B C N F, it says you have to check every dependency in F plus. However, I am going to claim that if we are given a set of dependencies on F to start with, this is what we are initially given, then it is enough to check every one of the dependencies in F 
without looking at f plus. And if every one of the dependencies in f does not violate b c n f, so if none of the dependencies in f causes a violation of b c n f, then the claim is that none of the dependencies in f plus will cause a violation of b c n f. Okay, again, I, I won't prove this formally. Um, no, the catch is this, and it's just coming up in the slide. So, if you are given a schema, a single schema with just one relation R with a set of functional dependencies, and all you have to do is check if this is in BCNF, then we do not have to compute F plus, we just have to check those. But there is a catch. This thing cannot be done, cannot be used if you decompose R. So, what do we mean? Uh, Let us do it by example. Uh, here is a relation R A B C D E and there are two functional dependencies A goes to B, B C goes to D. This is what you are given. Now, if I want to check if uh, R satisfies B C N F, what do I do? I take A plus. What is A plus? It is only A B. So, clearly this does not satisfy B C N F. Now, I decompose R using A B into A B and the remaining A C D E. Okay. Is this um, relation, uh, is this in B C N F? A B? It is. In fact, uh, it is kind of uh, trivial. Any binary relation will be in B C N F. If there is a functional dependency, clearly it also becomes a super key. Uh, no, there are two attributes A B. So, what, what is the question? Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I am just saying, I am saying the same thing in a different way <laughs> that if the relation is binary, then it will be a super key trivially. And the other one is A C D E. Is this in B C N F? Now, if you just look at these two uh, functional dependencies, it may appear to be so. A goes to B does not even apply here. Uh, B C goes to D does not even apply here. So, you might think that this is in B C N F. If you apply this simplified test using only the given things in F, but that is not the definition of B C N F. In definition is it you must use F plus. Now, what is there in F plus? Um, F plus actually has the following. Um, we have A goes to B, B C goes to D. So, if you use augmentation, you get A B goes to D. Now, A B goes to, um, I am sorry, uh, A C uh, goes to D. Um, so, we, we have A C goes to B C, B C goes to D. So, A C goes to D. So, if you have A C goes to D, that clearly shows that this guy is not in B C enough, because A C plus does not include E. So, it is not a super key. Therefore, this is not really in B C enough. So, although it, it looks tempting to use the only the original dependencies, it is not correct. You should really use, um, how do you check if a decomposition is in B C N F? We can of course, do the following. Uh, check each R i for B C N F with respect to the restriction of F to R i. That is all F d's in F plus that contain only attributes in R i. This is the definition. These are all the functional dependencies which hold on R i and these are the ones which we will use to check for B C N F. Or uh, there is a variant test which is equivalent, but it is easier to do manually. The check is the following. Use the original set of dependencies f, but the test is different. What we do is for every set of attributes alpha subset of r i, for every subset we do the following. Check if alpha plus the closure of alpha with respect to what? With respect to f. Check if the closure of alpha with respect to f either includes no attribute in R i minus alpha. In other words, with respect to R i that could be trivial or it includes all attributes of R i that is it is a super key. Now, this test is easy to do manually. You just take every subset, you take a decomposition, take every subset of attributes, compute its closure with respect to the original f and check if this is true. So, that this is very easy to do manually. Of course, it is going to take some time but uh, conceptually it is very easy. Okay, so, what we are doing is we are checking for every um, 
attribute alpha, every set or subset alpha. So, if it is violated by some alpha, then we can show that alpha goes to alpha plus minus alpha intersection r i, we can show this holds, um, th this exists in f plus and it holds on r i and then r i violates b c n f. So, this is the, uh, you know, if, if this is violated, we can show that this particular functional dependency would in fact show violation of b c n f and we will use this dependency to decompose r i. And conversely, if nothing, uh, no subset violates this, we can show that uh, this particular relation is in B C N F. Okay. So, the B C N F decomposition algorithm is um, again uh, fairly straightforward. We start with a single relation, given relation, which we want to check if it's in B C N F and decompose. Um, this version computes f plus, but like I said, we can skip computing f plus by changing the test here. Um, and now, we keep doing the following. If there is a schema r i uh, in result, result is initially, it is a set of sets. Initially, that set of sets contains only one set, which is r. So, if there is, uh, in general, if there is any set in result, which is not in B C N F, how do you check if it is not in B C N F? we can use the test we just saw. Then, pick a non-trivial functional dependency, um, which violates B C N F, because alpha goes to R i is not in F plus. And for simplicity, we are going to only take things where alpha intersection beta is empty set. Um, if it is not empty, we could actually remove that from the right hand side and use that one instead. And then, pull it out, pull out R i and insert into it r i minus beta and alpha beta and keep doing this until your uh, nothing more can needs to be decomposed. So, that is the basic B C N of decomposition algorithm. Excuse um, me, yes. I have a question to ask you. If you look at the normalization, hmm. there are various ways to uh, describe these same things, right? Yes. So, you are taking the algorithm root to describe all these things. Yeah. So, usually we look at the algorithms, computer science people, uh, if you have any intention of implementing them as. Uh, yeah. uh, so, is there any work done in uh, automating uh, yeah. so these in fact, processes? Uh, if you look at the algorithms we are using based on attribute closure, they are actually fairly easy to implement. Um, in contrast, the algorithms using Armstrong's axioms are harder, to, they can be implemented, but it is more complex to implement it efficiently. Uh, of course, all these are going to take exponential time, that is a given, but uh, you know, ignoring that aspect, um, implementing any of these algorithms based on attribute closure is actually quite easy. You can, you, you can give it as a course project even. Okay, so, let us uh, finish up. Uh, uh, my part of this session with uh, this example, uh, A, B, C, A, B and B, C. Now, um, we know that this is not in B, C N F, because um, B goes to C, but B is not a super key. We decompose into A, B and B, C. Um, now, are these two in B, C N F? We can say that kind of trivially, in, like I said, any binary relation will be in B, C N F. So, we do not even have to look any further. Here is another example, which is a class with course ID, title, department name, it is everything thrown in. Okay. So, it is a, a course joined with section, basically course joined with section. So, now if you look at this, course ID functionally determines title department credits. and uh, it, this is also joined with um, the classroom relation, which is um, building room number. Um, we have joined it, uh, you know, the section had building and room number where it meets. We have joined it with the classroom, which gives us capacity. So, we know that building room number determines capacity, that is clear. And finally, this is from section, course ID, section ID, semester year, uniquely determines where the room meets. So, building and room number. 
it also uniquely determines the time when it meets, so the time slot ID. So, these are the dependencies um, which we can in uh, from the conceptual mod, we know we are modeling a university. From that, we come up with these functional dependencies. They do not come out of thin air. We know that in the real world, these are the constraints which should hold. From that, we are creating this set of functional dependencies. Now, using these, we are going to do BCNF decomposition. Um, we can also get a candidate key, but uh, let us ignore that for the moment. We are focusing on decomposition. Uh, we can use this one, course ID, title, department, name, credit, to show that this is not in BCNF, because course ID is not a super key. So, we decompose it into course and class 1, which is the remaining attributes. Uh, course ID plus the, we just remove title, department, name, credits from there. Is this in BCNF? Again, we know it is not, because of this and this. So, we could use either uh, and also how do we know that course is in BCNF? That is another issue. Do we need to decompose course further? No. The only functional dependency that holds here is course ID determines the remaining ones. Now, there is no other functional dependency on this. We can show that. So, this is in BCNF, um, but class 1 has to be broken up because of this. So, we will use classroom building room number capacity and then the other one is section. Now, is this in BCNF? Again, the only dependency here is uh, building comma room number determines capacity, no, no other dependency. So, it is in BCNF. How about this one? Here, the only dependencies are this combination of four things determines building room number and time slot ID. That is only functional dependency, only non trivial one. So, again, this is in BCNF. So, we can stop. Uh, how do you find out uh, functional dependencies for the relation? For a given uh, If they are missing in the say business model, uh, where you are missed defining some of these, then yeah, how that's do you That is a good out? question. How do you come up with these in the first place? Right. Uh, so, the only way to do, the, if, if you are actually you know, building a schema for an enterprise, uh, you have to find out from people what are the constraints. And some are obvious. You know, if I have a classroom, and I want to model its capacity, I know that the same classroom cannot have two different capacities. Okay? So, some of these uh, are kind of obvious. Others may not be so obvious, but they are part of the uh, organizational constraints. So, for example, uh, should a section have only one teacher or should, it have, uh, should we allow more than one teacher? Okay? So, maybe uh, if you ask somebody in the organization, they will say, uh, all our courses so far have had only one teacher. So, I think that constraint should hold. But then you should also be careful. So far, all courses have had only one teacher, maybe. But do you expect that to always hold? Or do you think the organization at some point may allow two people to teach a course? So, this is a call which you have to make. Does this functional dependency hold or not? Um, who makes this call? So, again, you will have to make sure from everybody before accepting a functional dependency, you have to say not only does it hold today, do you expect it to hold in the future also or you expect it may get changed in the future. If it may change in the future, do not use it. If you have to impose it, do it at the application level, not at the database level. Because if you do it at the database level, that is if you use it to decompose your schema, you are in trouble. Later on, you cannot go back, you cannot undo it. Actually, my comment is that if you do not have a robust uh, SRS or uh, yeah. the business model in the beginning, everything will fail actually. Um, you ideally, you should have a proper SRS, but again in practice what happens is people do not put all the constraints into the SRS. They, people are lazy. So, in the end, it, uh, the designer kind of has to use the SRS, but also go back to the domain experts and you also have to update the SRS. Otherwise, it is like, you know, SRS says something, you did something else. That is a problem. So, you have to go back and update the SRS and your schema based on this kind of interaction with domain experts. Thank you.